بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to part number 9 of these discussions on Ahmad Bassam Asai's excellent book Al Mu'ajiza translated into English as The Miraculous Language of the Quran um, Evidence of Divine Origins So um, this is part 9 as you might have guessed from the title of the video itself and if you haven't watched the previous uh, parts please do so before indulging into this one because you wouldn't be able to understand much if you haven't watched the series from the start having said that let's begin in the name of Allah bismillahir rahmanir rahim rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli So uh, we are going to study the chapter entitled The Quran's Unique Character today, inshallah. Let's begin with it. As soon as the process of revelation began, the Arabs who, who heard the Quran realized instinctively that everything relating to its suggested newness and singularity These qualities could be perceived in its distinctive name, Quran. Allah says in the Quran himself, Allah gives the name to this book himself and says, Inna anzalnahu Quranan Arabiyan la'allakum ta'aqilun. Now, there is a very interesting fact that I want to share with you here. Um, this is a video by brother Farid al-Bahraini in which he refutes Shadi Hikmat Nasir and in, in this video he plays a short clip in which Shadi Hikmat Nasir is quoting a fabricated hadith, a fabrication relating to this and it becomes really f a really funny situation really so i want you guys to indulge in it with me for a minute let's watch this you, you have a you have a good uh, common sense as well because i mean in the same in the same narrative i mean speaking of that in the same account or in, a, in an offshoot account after you know they made the first collection okay so they he went around and then he started asking you know other companions okay tell me what you memorized and then he started writing them them down At the end, according to one narrative, so Abu Bakr, you know, they put the, the uh, you know, the collection in front of the book, and then he said, what should we call it? Did you hear it? The fabricated hadith goes like this, that when they collected the Quran and put it in front of Abu Bakr, they asked, what should we call it? <laughs> I mean, check this guy out, man. This is the biasness that these mustashriqeen, these orientalists come from. <laughs> wow. Right? So what should we call? I mean, see, it's, it's uh, again, it doesn't matter whether this account is made up or not. It, it doesn't matter if this account is made up or, or not. Are you serious, professor? Really? I mean, really being an academic? You're saying it doesn't really matter if this account is made up or, or not? How stupid does one need to be to see through the biasness and the jaundiced-eyed approach of these mustashriqeen, these orientalists? I mean, really, it tells you what people were thinking back there? No, Professor, they weren't as stupid as you are. Pardon my language. Allah says Himself in the Quran, Inna anzalnahu Quran an Arabian. So, are you really stupid or are you really stupid? That's my question. They all knew this is called Quran. They all knew. You, on the other hand, sir, are. Well, okay, let's, let's not go there. 
But really, professor, you are an assistant professor, I think, I'm guessing, as yet. Uh, but this is, this breaks my heart, man, really. I thought you had some salt. I, I thought you were really an academic, but you're not. You're just a, another jaundiced-eyed propagandist. That's what you prove yourself to be. I mean, check this out, man. Check this out. He is quoting a fabricated tradition to say that they didn't even know what to call the collection, the collected edition, the collected mushaf. Does that make any sense? When Allah says in the Quran Himself, Inna anzalnahu Quran an Arabiyan la Allah kunta aqilun. Brother Freed is really funny sometimes. Exactly. So basically, you are undermining, you're trying to undermine the Quran, right? And your jaundiced eye approach is Azhar Mina Shams here, Professor. Ya Shadi. Ya Shadi Hikmat Nasir. Anyways, uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, interjection. So, yeah, so let's begin from the start as soon as the process of revelation began the Arabs who, who heard the Quran realized instinctively that everything relating to it suggested newness and singularity so they right away felt this uh, very potent uh, form of expression the, the, the impact of this very f uh, potent form of expression newness in the expression which pre uh, these qualities could be perceived in its distinctive name Quran, which pre-Islamic Arabs have never used before, and the uniqueness of the book's title pointed to the uniqueness of its content. Right, the same newness and singularity are reflected in the uh, title given to the Quran's opening chapter, Al Fatiha which was unique to the Qur'an alone. As for the word surah, which was used to refer to the Qur'an's sections or chapters, it was derived from the word sur, which refers to a city wall or a citadel. Again, um, and I talked about this in my previous videos, compare this and contrast this with what Imam Farahi says about Nazm al-Qur'an and how the uh, surahs of the Quran are connected, are in um, in couples. I don't really side with that. I side with Ahmad Bassam as Sa'i, and he's really proving the miraculousness of the Quran. Every surah has its own wall or its own citadel. It's unique in its properties, at least in its lingual properties. Nobody can disagree on that. We can talk about other things. We can talk about thematic structuration and whatnot. But I feel that at some level, if you're saying that these are related, you're taking away something from the miraculousness of the Quran. That's my feeling. I have not 
really dug into Imam Farahi as yet, his primary sources. So please don't quote me on this. But inshallah, we'll come to it when we come to it. So the meaning of this term was like a heavenly sign pointing to the impregnability of the Quran's walls and the impossibility of either imitating its chapters, surahs, or finding gaps or breaches that would allow someone to make his way inside them. Right. This also ties in with the um, with the belief of the Muslims that shaitan cannot interject in the wahi. Next, we come to the term ayah, meaning a sign or a miracle, which God used to refer to the verses of the Quran. In this designation, we have another divine hint pointing to the miraculous nature of the book as a whole and to the element of challenge inherent in every one of its linguistic units. Be it long or short. And lastly, we come to the term tilawa, derived from the verb yatslu, meaning to follow or to come after. The word tilawa came to be applied to the recitation of the Quran in a reminder from heaven that the messenger of God was not the first person to have recited the Quran's verses on earth but was rather a follower in its recitation since Gabriel had been the first to recite them and the prophet had followed him by imitating the angel's recitation and we follow the Prophet So also understand this and this is extremely important this is an extremely important point people who say well saying that the Prophet was an ummi was illiterate it doesn't make sense because how can an illiterate do all the things that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam did. He's not an illiterate in the sense that, you know, that we use the word in today's culture. His status of being illiterate is primarily because only he, he only received from Allah. That's it. Because if we say that he was not illiterate that he was learned then we'll have to look at his teachers his worldly teachers the institutions where he went the, the places that he went and then there will be a probability in assuming that his teachers were obviously more knowledgeable than him right or that he wrote in the quran what he learned from his teachers so all of these things come into play and to really uh, stop anyone from thinking any of this Allah taught the Prophet ﷺ himself and nobody else taught him ever. And there are people, Quraniyin especially, who say, oh, but this is false. You know, he didn't imitate, he, he had an intellect, he had education. Well, then my question is, who, who were his teachers, right? Without imitation, there is no tilawa. There is no tilawa, there is no tsala yatlu. This is, recitation is by imitation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam imitated Jibreel alayhi salam and we imitated Rasulullah, we imitate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the way the Quran has reached us today. So, then they turn around the Quranis and others and ask, oh, well, why did then the angels say, Iqra? And this is naive really. Your two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, you tell him to read, you place a book in front of him or her, your child, and you tell them to read. Do they know how to read at that age? No. But you read for them, you, you, you teach them the phonemes and phonetics by uh, reading those words, C-A-T, cat, ka, ka, a, a, at. Say ka ka a a at, and then you tell them that you should relate these sounds to the semantic form. They are not literate, but they learn through imitation. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not literate; he was illiterate, but he learned the Quran through imitation. You know, don't be naive. You know, don't be stupid. 
really. So, yeah, that was one of the points that I wanted to clarify here. It should be stressed here that the Holy Quran is the only book in the world which to, to this day has continued to be marked by features that it shares with no other book on earth. The comparison being made here is not based on the book's subject matter, ideas, language, or style. After all, every book in the world is bound to have certain features that um, set it apart from all others in relation to its topic, the ideas it presents, and its linguistic style. Rather, what I am speaking of here is the genus of book qua book. If, for example, you compared the book in your hands now with any other book in your library, you would find nothing that set it apart from the others insofar as it is a book. We might, of course, compare a book written in English with a book written in Arabic, in which case we could say that each of the two books is distinguished by two features, the language in which it was written, one in English, the other one is in Arabic, and two, the direction in which it is read. The one in English being read from left to right, the one in Arabic being read from right to left. This is the extent of the difference between these two books. However, neither of these books is distinguished from all other books in the world by either of these features, right? There are millions of other books in the world that have been written in Arabic or in English. The Quran, by contrast, is marked by a number of features that it shares with no other book on the face of the earth and no other book in the history of humankind. I have counted up 20 and distinct, such distinguishing features, 12 of which I list below. And these are very important. These are extremely important to note. The first one, unique terms are used to refer to its chapters and verses. Surah, Ayah. It can be read in more than one way, with all these ways being viewed as divinely inspired. Sabata Ahruf, the different recitations of the Quran, the variant readings. The way, number three, the way it is recited differs from the way it is written. So there's also differences in the way the Sephiotic script was, uh, was adapted to, was adopted, and uh, what is today popularly known as Rasmul uh, Uthmani, uh, the way Hazrat Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu wrote it down, collected it. And the way it is pronounced, right? There is a difference between the two. There's a slight difference between that. Well, this is really a very te technical subject, and if you guys want to, please read up on Ahmad al Jallad. The guy has done some excellent work in this regard. Examples of this include the words of prayer, as salah, alms tax, as zakah. I have written these here. So, al haya, as salah, as zakah. You don't write it, write salah like this. You write Salah like this, right? So, um, yeah. And life, al haya which are written in the Quran with the letter Wow, representing a long U sound, although we read it as an Alif, which represents an A sound, as in the word cat. Another example is the word Qawarira in Surah Al-Insan, which is recited without the final extra alif, a sound, although it appears in the written word. Number four, its text is pronounced differently from any other Arabic text in the world. This is the difference of Tajweed. This differing manner of pronunciation has been elaborated in detail through the art of Tajweed, or Quranic recitation, in keeping with established rules of pronunciation and intonation. It is written, number five, it is written differently than any other Arabic text. This is due to the fact that the spelling rules on the basis of which the Quran is written differ from those used in modern Arabic, as well as from those that were used 14 centuries ago. Number six, it can only be documented based on having heard it recited aloud by others. 
السماع بالتواتر in addition and, and I have talked about this phenomenon in, in, in detail you can watch my other videos especially the videos that I have made on the Qiraat and uh, you'll get to know what I'm talking about I have tried to really elaborate on, on this um, point al aslu fil qur'ani al i'tamad ala hifz al qulub al i'tamad ala hifz al qulub la ala hifz al makatib al al hifz al hifz al masahif the primary source of the quran is the oral tradition not the written tradition it is extremely important to note it's the qiraat that make the Qur'an, not the text. In addition to reliance, reliance on the rules of tajweed, documentation of the Qur'an depends on an oral chain of transmission that goes back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself. The Qur'an is, number seven, the Qur'an is recited melodically as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam commanded. Recite the Qur'an with a melody. He will be not one of us who does not recite it in this manner. Not one of us, meaning that he is not following the way of the Prophet So it is actually decreed that we should read the Quran in a melodious tone, in a in melodious voice. Number eight, the linguistic style of the Quran is entirely different from that of the person who delivered it to us, that is the Prophet ﷺ. We have seen this and we are, we are continuing to see this. Millions of people, number nine, millions of people throughout the world have memorized it from cover to cover. This is not true uh, for any other book in the world, any other book whatsoever. Number 10, most of those who have memorized the Quran do not speak Arabic and do not even understand it. Subhanallah. Arabs make up no more than 20% of the world's Muslim. Only 20% people who have memorized the Quran know Arabic. Number 11. The various texts of the Quran are confirmed millions of times a day. It is recited aloud three times a day at dawn prayer, the sundown prayer, the final evening prayer in the context of communal prayers all over the world. This is in addition to the communal Friday prayer and the communal prayers conducted on the occasions of Eid al-Fitr al and Eid al-Adha. These prayers have taken place in hundreds of thousands of mosques the world over for 14 centuries ever since the command to prayer was issued. If the prayer leader mispronounces a word or makes any other error, in his recitation, he will be corrected immediately by scores of worshippers who are praying behind him. This remarkable intensive method of authentication makes it impossible for so much as a single word or letter to be omitted from or added to the Quran or for any word or phrase to be corrupted in any way. Subhanallah. Number 12. The Quran ignited the most widespread scientific revolution the world has ever known and in record time. Apart from the Quran, no single book in history of humankind has ever brought about a literary, scientific, intellectual and linguistic revolution in the space of only a few decades. And on an isolated, unlettered peninsula among whose inhabitants the Bible was the only book in circulation. Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Amma Yushrikun. So we are continuing with the, these discussions, and Alhamdulillah, we finished today's podcast on this note of another feature of these features of the miraculousness of uh, the divine book of the divine kalam, and Inshallah, in the next episode of the series, we are going to look at the chapter called The New Linguistic Formulation. So till then, take care of yourselves and keep reading the Quran and may Allah make it a shafi' for you in the hereafter and for all of us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.